Hey guys, Daniel Theodore here with the one and only legend, Judo Jean LaBelle. How's it going, sir? You really give a damn? I, I do. You're a legend in so many different avenues. I give a damn and any red-blooded American should give a damn. Well, Daniel, is that as good as $5 cash? No, I'd rather have $5 cash, but uh, I'll take an interview with you. If I, I thought you were on a diet and you didn't need the money for food. They'll, People don't, you don't eat at the midnight mission anymore? No, they'll, they'll cover Subway nowadays. Oh, maybe. well, that's good food, too. You were the AAU National Judo Champion in 1954 and 55 in uh, both divisions, correct? Well, I was in, uh, I won the heavyweight division as a light heavyweight. Then when all the groups go together, the champions of each group go together and they get the overall champion. And for two years, I won that. So how, how old were you when you started Judo? Oh, God, uh, about seven. Wow. Okay. I boxed a couple years before that. Oranges, apples. That, that leads me to the next question. You fought the top-ranked middle, middleweight boxer, Milo Savage, in the first ever U.S. sanctioned mixed rules or MMA fight in well, 1963. Let's clear that up. He was rated number five in the world, great fighter, Milo Savage. He fought five world champions, never got knocked off his feet. But he was so good, the good fighters didn't want to fight him. So I participated in the first televised mixed martial art event. And now you see him every week on television. You had a lot to do with it. How did that one go? It went four rounds? Uh, it went four rounds. It's actually supposed to be ten rounds. Then the uh, promoters and their guys came up and said it's to a finish. And I says, well, what's a finish? He says, well, the first one's unconscious. So if you break a leg or break an arm, he might still be given the Tasmanian twitch and he'd be awake. So he either has to knock me out with brass knuckles that he was wearing. Yeah, he had loaded gloves. You think he had brass knuckles underneath his gloves? Uh, no doubt about it. I saw him. And so did my uh, trainer, uh, Larry Korn, saw him also. He said, before he went in, he says, you're not going to fight him. But, uh, you know, when you're young and full of piss and whatever, <laughs> you don't give a damn. You think you can beat the world. But try to use your brain. So how did you finish him off? Well, you can buy the movie. Uh, it's only like 20 bucks at GeneLabelle.com, G-E-N-E-L-E-B-E-L-L.com. And pick up his book at you know, a th a thousand Encyclopedia to a Thousand Submission Holes while you're there, too. And you, can, point it. and you can see who won the, the fight. And, uh, it was spectacular. It's 1963. This is this is 30 years exactly before the first UFC in America. That's being a trailblazer. Uh, yeah, it's a trailblazer, and it's nice to make a few bucks while you're doing your little shtick. But it's a stupid thing to do. But now in the MMA, you have the commissions all over the world. You have two or three doctors that are signed, and they say, why do they have more than one doctor? Well, if somebody gets hurt and needs stitches, one doctor takes the man to the hospital, and the other one is ready for the next event. And uh, so uh, nowadays, under the sanction of the athletic commissions, it's very professional and is, they're very safety conscious. You also worked a lot of matches as a pro, pro wrestler. You ran the NWA for many, many years in the L.A. area, correct? Uh, I wrestled pro for many years. My family had an auditorium called the Olympic Auditorium for 38 years. And there I met world champion wrestlers, boxers, and got a chance to work out with most of them. It was a great learning experience. You learned a lot of holds from, from that kind of background. Oh, yeah. And show, Everybody, and show holds and, and real. Yeah, but everything with holds. the wrestlers I worked with, like Carl Gosh, Lou Thez, Vic Christie, they're all the real thing. And uh, I, the, the clowns, 
I just didn't care about. Because mm-hmm. uh, they're all short-lived and they get a heart a lot because they can't really wrestle that well. They might have dyed hair and long hair and walk like a fruitcake, but... Uh, or just George Jackson? Well, gorgeous George. He liked him, though. He was a good show. was George Wheeler. And uh, my mother, Eileen Eaton, who was the promoter at the Olympic for 38 years and had the auditorium, he uh, got him started as a uh, cartoon figure. Uh, she was down at the Olympic, and he was there, too, and I was also there. And she says, I have to leave and go have my hair done. She says, George, you want your hair done? Because he had long hair. He said, yes. So he went down there. They dyed his hair uh, pink or whatever it was, white or golden. He had these bobby pins. And they're called gold <laughs> bobby pins. And uh, I looked at them. They weren't real gold, but <laughs> anyway, uh, they, uh, in the wind is gorgeous, George had himself a, a stick man who got in the ring and um, did perfume to purify the air. <laughs> and he was uh, quite a novelty. For the character.